Hey everyone, Duke Nougat 3 d here, back again with another gas mask review, and today we'll be taking a look at the U.S. Navy Diaphragm Gas Mask Mark V. This is a mask I've already had in my collection, although the previous one that I owned had the harness brake on it, and uh, the, that's sort of the Achilles heel of this mask that I'll get into in a bit. And at some point I had disassembled it to, you know, sort of get an understanding of how it worked and all that. So I don't really had, I hadn't really had a complete example to make a review of until now. So I'm, that is the object of this video. So without further ado, the development of the Navy Diaphragm Mark V is a bit of an interesting one because to give you some background, the development of U.S. Navy gas masks has always seemed to ride the coattails of Army development, with many of the Navy Diaphragm series being obsolete Army Diaphragm masks or simply rejected Army prototype designs that the Navy liked to their needs. And by the end of World War II, the U.S. Navy was looking to replace its stocks of Navy Diaphragm Mark III, Mark IV, and Navy Diaphragm Optical Mark I masks, which uh, were still in use well into the 1950s. So engineers at MIT developed, um, decided to take the best influences from several designs employed by the Navy, including the Mark IV, as well as the NC-1, although the correct designation, I believe, is Navy Civilian Type 1A or Model 1A Type NC. I, I don't remember, but I'll, I'll probably put it in the description. Um, nevertheless, the the uh, engineers at MIT took the general design pattern of the NC-1 and they coupled it with the general robustness of the Mark IV and they came out with a design pattern which is probably one of the more peculiar um, design choices in U.S. military history because this is not only the only U.S. service mask, like the only standard service mask that uses a five-point rubber head harness, but it is also the only gas mask in U.S. military history to use a filter system which attaches through means of rubber skirts around a metal mounting disc, similar to a lens outsert, but in this case being a filter. Initial prototypes were developed um, or produced by the B.F. Goodrich Company and later MSA, and some of the early prototypes did actually see service, uh, although the sort of they sort of fell out of production relatively quick with more refined examples. And so this is the general pattern of which you would see most examples being by the uh, by the late 1950s. And the design was adopted around 1957, 1952, but it was not fully put into production uh, until about 1957, from what I understand. The Navy Diaphragm Mark V is interesting in the fact that it is probably also one of the only masks to outlive the mask that it, uh, well not outlive, uh, excuse me, what am I saying? It, uh, the Navy Diaphragm Mark V was obsoleted by the MCU-2P in 1983, however the Navy Diaphragm Mark V continued to see service well into the mid-1990s due to stocks of the MCU-2P series not really becoming uh, available until after the Gulf War. There was several MCU-2Ps in use during the Gulf War, but as far as I know, the majority of the Navy continued to still use the Navy Diaphragm Mark V. Um, so it is very interesting to note that this example I have for you today is a 1984 produced example, which again is a year after the mask would have been officially obsoleted, but it still continued service well into then. And I've seen manuals dated around 1995 that picture and reference the use of this mask. Um, not really too much else to say about it. There really isn't any historical context. This is sort of a dead-end design with no real background or hi history or future leads. It's just the mask that the U.S. Navy used from 1957 until the mid-1990s. So, um, that being said, let's get into the kit itself. One of the more recognizable ports, uh, um, uh, pieces of the kit is its carrier, which, of which there were several different variants ranging in various different markings and material colors, with the earliest examples being a sort of OG-103 khaki color, but later ones being more of this sort of grayish khaki with blue trim color um, carriers. And here, as you can see, is an example of a... This, this carrier is a 1968 dated example, and you can see it says U.S. Navy Gas Mask Navy Diaphragm Mark V. The, um, the, the national stock number and as you can see, the carrier is pretty simple. It's just a very basic pouch with a aluminum reinforcement integrally sewn into the carrier. There is a loop for the anti-dimming cloth on the bottom of the carrier, and then there is a fleece patch lining the interior face to protect the flexible urethane lens from scratching and damage. It uses two straps, one which would go around the waist and the other which would go around the thigh, making this essentially a leg carry only design. However, I have seen footage and photographs of U.S. Navy personnel um, shoulder carrying this, which is very interesting considering that it is not sewn or designed to be shoulder carried, but nevertheless, it has been done. 
And here we can see the carrier that actually came with this mask, which is a later uh, pattern carrier. And the later ones, as you can see, will be marked mask, chemical, biological, ND mark five, instead of just US Navy gas mask, Navy, uh, Navy diaphragm mark five or whatever. Um, so basically the same details, national stock number. And on this example, mine, the, the one I have here is actually issued to a, a carrier air wing 45 and I haven't been able been able to find any information about that uh, carrier air wing group So if anyone has any information pertinent to that Specific group feel free to let me know in the comments because I have not been able to find anything about it And then I assume 169 is a stock reference number to indicate to which person this mask was issued to opening up the carrier it just opens with a single lift the dot snap and as simple as the carrier seems, it is actually kind of difficult to close this flap as there needs to be a considerable amount of material crushed in the back in order for this to fully fit. And removing the strap here, getting that out of the way, there's really nothing to see inside the carrier. Hopefully you can see the anti-dimming cloth loop on the bottom there. And um, you can see the fleece patch lining the interior face. And that's about it. The only other accessories that would have been issued with this mask are the um, the M5 and M5A1 atropine and protective ointment kits, and possibly the M13 decontaminating and reimpregnating kit. However, I'm not entirely sure on that. Um, I have here the tin that the C1 canisters came in, and again, these were from my 1968 dated example, and these are not original to this kit. But nevertheless, they're C1 canisters. And again, the C1 canisters are very interesting in the fact that they attach with rubber skirts like a lens outsert. And I've never seen that system done on any other mask. And this is, as far as I know, the only mask to use that system. And the only mask that uses 50 millimeter canisters. That's the official uh, designation. Even though they're not threaded, that's just the diameter of what they're mounted to. And then here you have the, uh, the um, fog-proof liquid, which... Um, on the earlier examples from the 60s and 50s, this would have been standard, but on later 1980s dated examples, they would have used the green plastic M1 anti-fogging kit, which I don't have for this kit, but I probably will end up acquiring through some means. So that's that. Uh, actually, I might as well just open it up and show you what's inside. It's interesting because it doesn't come with a paste or a wax stick, but the Navy Diaphragm Mark V's come with this actual MSA fog-proof liquid, which uh, in most cases the bottle's empty. There's nothing in here. And when I opened it, it does have a very faint strawberry-ish smell, so that's kind of interesting. And now finally onto the mask itself, which again was one of the more peculiar designs in American gas mask history, just for its odd choice of design complexes. So obviously there's two bilaterally mounted C1 pancake filter discs, which again are mounted with a rubber skirt, which I'm not even going to demonstrate how to undo because this is probably almost as if not the same amount of pain as mounting M17 series filters. Like if you thought pork chop filters were bad, imagine doing a giant circular lens outsert that with very thick, stiff rubber. So that's it's very difficult to install these filters and very obnoxious. You can see the diaphragm angle tube assembly on the front of the mask, and the diaphragm is relatively unprotected, and one can easily just stick a pin inside any of these holes and puncture the diaphragm easily, so sort of a questionable design choice regarding that. The outlet valve is a typical C15 style valve with a disc in the center and a shroud with um, several spikes on the inside to de-ice the valve in case of arctic temperatures however i don't believe this mask would really be suited for arctic temperatures due to its uh sort of frail nature it's a very thin rubber mask it's not a very sturdy mask at all really um on the forehead you can see some markings navy diaphragm mark five and then the uh, national stock number as always you have ho two hood stops on the forehead region of the mask which are utterly useless because they are very minuscule and they fail to make any impact of a hood sliding over the lens. So it's kind of pointless to add those. Uh, the head harness, as I've mentioned before, is a five point rubber head harness, which is interesting in the fact that it uses several different types of buckles. Um, three, the, the forehead and the temple straps use these um, sort of sliding buckles, which um, sort of catch on solid rubber, whereas the lower two straps use a sort of industrial style buckle with um, molded ridges in the strap itself that catch on the roller buckle itself. Um, this is where I mentioned that the uh, Navy Diaphragm Mark V's heavy problem with their head harness is that the top strap is made of a slightly thicker, not as stretchy rubber as the temple straps, and thus um, usually in the area where it is looped through the strap, it has taken a permanent set, and if you try to unflex that, if you try to stretch that in most cases, that the harness strap will just break instantly. So luckily this one is still plenty flexible, and I have been trying to store it without it looped through the buckle, and I would recommend anyone that gets a Mark V, um, if they can, undo all the buckles when you're not 
um, you know, displaying it or just keeping it stored so that it does not uh, degrade any further and take a permanent set. And the fur rubber head harness is actually one of the more comfortable rubber harnesses I've, ever, uh, I've actually worn. Given that the head pad is very broad, wide, it's very smooth rubber, at least when you put silicone on it, because these masks are harbingers of bloom, and they, um, they can feel quite tacky when they're new, and it, I'd recommend anyone who gets a Mark V to clean it off with Trident brand food grade silicone spray like I always use, but nevertheless, very comfortable five-point rubber harness, um, and it's, uh, as you can see, there's sort of a molded ridge, or a sort of bold out in a dome shape along the head pad so makes it much more comfortable and then really nothing to see externally um, you may be able to notice that the lens is a little bit warped on this example this one has been issued and it is despite being in otherwise perfect condition the urethane lens which is permanently glued into the mask by the way is uh, a little bit deformed from improper storage and possible heat um, i'm not entirely sure how it got to that point definitely improper storage but uh, not too big of a deal because it's still very visible and uh, with most Mark V's the lenses do yellow or orange quite a bit so it's not uncommon to see navy diaphragm Mark V's with completely red lenses from time to time. But anywho, let me undo the head harness and I will show you the interior of the mask because that's also where a very interesting and unique feature of this mask is present that no other US masks even share. So. Those of you who may know um, British masks, such as the S6, that mask has an inflatable face seal. It is one of the only masks that has an inflatable face seal, but it is not the only mask. Because, the reason I mention, if you give me one moment to get the harness inverted, is that with the Navy Diaphragm Mark V, it too has an inflated face seal. Yes, um, the interior periphery of the face seal is entirely, inf uh, is entirely an inflated air cushion. Um, the only detriment... Um, in this design is that unlike the S6, where that could be deflated and reinflated, this is just permanently inflated and you can't change the air pressure at all, especially if it punctures. I believe you can actually replace the cushions on the S6. Uh, again, prove me wrong if I'm incorrect on that. Um, but with this, you cannot do anything with it. It's permanently integral to the mask. And if that's punctured, it's useless. And which I can see it getting punctured very easily because this is very thin rubber compared to most masks. Like this is only maybe a millimeter and a half thick around the chin piece here so it's pretty much consistent throughout the rest of the face piece as well and you can see where lies in the biggest flaw of the mark V is, is its inherent um proneness to fogging as it lacks an internal oral nasal cup and the two beefy deflectors only do so much as to prevent the condensate from building up on the eyepiece and so a anti-fogging kit was standard with this um, really nothing else to see other than the internals of the diaphragm angle tube and the outlet valve um, you can see on this example it is retained with a single um, ear clamp around the top there as um, older examples like my 1968 example would have had wire and tape around this assembly um, but in later examples like this one from 1984 it uses a ear clamp and then there's the manufacturer stamp on the interior of the um, forehead strap um, you can see it is marked 84 and I don't know what company that's, that is. It says LPN. Most Mark IVs that I see are either made by MSA or a Cushnet marked as IX. Um, but in this case, this one's marked LPN, and I'm not really sure what company that is or what manufacturer that could possibly be. So if anyone has any insight on what LPN possibly means as a company, uh, feel free to leave it down in the comments below. And um, really nothing else to see regarding that. So I will go ahead and put it on the head again and wrap up the review. So... Again, um, despite its flaws, the Mark IV is, I mean, excuse me, the Mark V is a very comfortable mask and is, I mean, obviously did the job it needed to. I'm not saying it's a bad design. It has some inherent flaws with its principles, but I assume for the Navy it was good enough for what it needed to be. So in that case, it's not a bad mask. Um, certainly, again, a very peculiar design in U.S. history, given that it does not follow most standard U.S. design logic, but um, nevertheless, it's a design we adopted and used for several years. So that's about it. Um, if you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them down in the comments below. I'm Duke Nuga 3D, and I'll see you all later.